turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Again, if you're watching the film, we're sorry you, we had to turn you away if you couldn't get in in the last few weeks. It was not our doing, I assure you. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter. It will lead to further ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Men who have gone astray from the truth, saying the resurrection has already taken place, and thus they upset the fate of some. I'm looking at this in the original Greek. I don't want to bore you too much with it, but I'm going to bore you anyway. <laughs> what it's essentially saying is, those who do not accurately exegete the scripture, those who do not accurately exegete what the scripture says, and we'll explain that, are going to wind up in arguing and disputing about words and being almost picayune and wrangling about words that wouldn't be necessary if they were rightly dividing the word of God. Okay? The result of this is false doctrine that is damaging to the body. And the text actually calls them babblers. They become babblers. So if you do not correctly exegete the text, you're going to wind up in disputes about words and meanings. In other words, if they correctly exegeted the text to begin with, these arguments wouldn't happen. Now, there are two aspects of this that we've talked about before one of which is pill pull, pill pull. The Jewish way of argumentation that Jesus was up against with these Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. Again, where you get the joke, if you have two Jews, you have three opinions. It could mean this, it might not mean that. It could mean, you know, the legalistic dispute about words like lawyers. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it said that Jesus spoke as one with authority, not like the Pharisees. The reason is he interpreted the letter in light of the spirit. He interpreted the letter in light of the spirit. The spirit of the law says, if you lust after somebody you're not married to, as far as God's concerned, you've committed adultery. <laughs> the letter is the Bill Clinton thing. You know, <laughs> you get into technical legalistic argumentation to try to circumvent the issue. Jesus was straight. That's one aspect. Secondly, they became selective. They didn't correctly divide the word of God. Text, context, co-text. Okay, thou shalt not commit adultery or thou shalt not steal. Two of the Ten Commandments of the Decalogue. But there's another one, thou shalt not covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shouldn't desire somebody sexually you're not married to. Or you shall not covet your neighbor's good. You shouldn't want that which belongs to another person. It's as bad as stealing it. <laughs> or it's as bad as going into marital infidelity. It's just as bad. Thou shalt not, they took certain bits of scripture and they tried to make an argument based on that. Not co-text. They would ignore the co-text. Other scriptures that explain it or are, are related to it in meaning that you interpret it in light of other scripture talking about the same thing. 
We always interpret scripture in light of scripture, the text and context, but then the third element is the co-text. So when you interpret thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, in light of thou shalt not covet, it's there. It's there. But they play games with the words like crooked lawyers. Okay? Now think of crooked lawyers. There are theologians who behave like crooked lawyers. There are scholars who behave like crooked lawyers. There are preachers, Christian authors, who behave like crooked lawyers. A crooked lawyer has a guilty client. So what he needs to do is by any means he can create reasonable doubt in the mind of a jury. Create reasonable doubt even though the prima facie evidence or the forensic evidence, the direct evidence would indict, incriminate, he's got to create reasonable doubt, okay? So he amplifies certain circumstantial things out of proportion. They will amplify circumstantial evidence out of proportion to make it seem like it's solid evidence or prima facie evidence, okay? And try to persuade a jury. Now, a judge has to instruct the jury. They can do certain things and not this, that, but it's still going to be up to the jury. You can persuade people. With words, you can con people. Ah, well, let's look at the issue of baptism. There are two kinds of scriptures in the Bible, the New Testament, about the issue of baptism. There are those passages that directly support believers' baptism, right? And there are those passages which are ambiguous. Instead of interpreting the ambiguous passages in light of the unambiguous ones, what people in churches that practice infant baptism do, Anglicans, Lutherans, and the others, they have to amplify the passages that are ambiguous beyond what the scripture says in order to cast doubt upon the unambiguous ones. You and your household, well the household in those days included babies and children and servants and they were all baptized. they did. That's what they did. Or somebody who the devil used tremendously when he changed one word and one parable. The wheat and tares. In the wheat and tares, let them both grow together till the harvest. Don't destroy the tares, you might destroy the wheat with it. At the harvest, will be a separation. And the text says that the field where the wheat and tares are growing, the field is the world. In order to justify or attempt to justify Constantine the Great's pseudo-Christianization of the Roman Empire, Augustine of Hippo changes one word. He calls the field the church. Well, the Roman Empire is the world. <laughs> okay. And now Christianity is the religion of the empire. So we can have the world as, as the church. Sprinkle the babies. Sprinkle everybody. Call them all Christian until the end of the age. Then the Lord will determine who was really saved and who wasn't. Now one of the worst things you can do is to baptize someone as a baby and then tell them they need to become a Christian when they grow up. Amen. If you look in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, the original one, it says that they're born again at the time. No, they're not born again. So you have an Anglican who gets saved at the age of 14 or 16 or something like that, and that you, have, you need to become a Christian. What do you mean I need to become a Christian? I've always been a Christian. I was, what a mess! comes from changing one word. 
in a politically orchestrated maneuver. <laughs> you understand? It's the religion of the empire. It's the world. So now the world is the church. The church is the world. The distinction is gone. This is bad stuff. This is bad stuff. But they do it. Another, I won't go into it much now, is, is the eternal security of the believer. There are passages that teach the eternal security of the believer that is conditional. There are other passages which are ambiguous. There are other passages which are unambiguous, and there are passages that are ambiguous. It's clear from Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, or 1 Corinthians 5, why would Paul give this person over to Satan to destroy his flesh that his soul might be saved if he was not, if he was unconditionally once saved, always saved? That's you know, the theoretical possibility must exist of this guy being eternally lost to an into the incestuous immorality. Um, instead of interpreting the ambiguous in light of the unambiguous, now, when crooked lawyers do that, well, <laughs> that's what they're paid for. <laughs> you ever notice how lawyer sounds like liar? <laughs> I got to be careful. Both my children are lawyers. <laughs> but that's not what a theologian or a scholar or a Christian author or a preacher is paid for. They are paid to expound the scriptures as truth. Jesus did not speak ambiguously. He did not engage in pill pull. He said, this is this. When you see people wrangling about words, it is because they have deviated from rightly dividing the word of God. Let's begin in verse 14. Tauta hupomeneske, dia motoremenos, en opion to curio, me lobo making. These are these things, hoopamon, be under reminding. It's the same word, hoopamoni, like the way you'd reinforce a ship by tying a cable underneath it. Whoa. The way you would reinforce a ship by tying a, a cable under it. You have to do it that particular way, OK? Um, so it's saying strengthen or reinforce by reminding these things. The next word, dia mortorimenos, is like mortidio, witnessing. Same, same root word as martyrs. They are witnessing in the sight and opion tocurio of the Lord. So. You remember these things in the sight of God. You remember these things in the sight of God, not just in the sight of man. Then it continues, Logomachian uh, es oden, chrysimon epi catastrophe ton aconton. Logo makian, to be engaging in controversy. Logo word, you begin fighting about the meaning of a word. Remember Bill Clinton? It depends on what the meaning of is is. <laughs> you begin fighting about the meaning of a word. Okay. And it says, it's open Christimon into not one yet useful. There's no value in this stuff. They're doing things that are of no theological or spiritual value. Epi around catastrophe. That they strive about words to no profit, but they bring about it says we translate it subverting the hearers. What it actually says in Greek is it causes a catastrophe. It causes a catastrophe within the church. When you see people wrangling about words, 
instead of rightly dividing the word of God, the result is going to be some kind of catastrophe. Now, you can go on internet, and now you can even find evangelicals dealing with Romans 1, saying it was only talking about idolatrous expressions of homosexuality, or only talking about the hieros gamos, you know, the, the temple prostitutes and things. It wasn't talking about same-sex relationships. Well, temple prostitution is not even mentioned in Romans. It's mentioned in other scriptures, but it's not mentioned in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is talking specifically about homosexuality. They begin adding to it. They be introducing things that are not in the original text. Now, there are co-texts that speak of that, but the co-text does not say homosexuality is right. It just means two things. With the Hieros Gamos or the Hieros Delphos, the Temple Brothers, you're paying for it. It became so perverted that they would go to a temple to Adonis, the male physique god, and you would pay one of these male prostitutes for unnatural sexual relations as a form of worship. They made it a religious thing. You understand? The pagans made it a religious thing. Well, in the last days, this gets into the church. They make it a religious thing. When Steve Chalk was asked to perform a same-sex marriage privately and secretly by two homosexuals in his church, he refused. He said, I'll never do that. We're going to do it publicly. <laughs> Again, this is the leading youth minister in the United Kingdom. Uh, what's in the pagan world gets into the church. That's what Timothy's talking about. Last night, we looked at the moral breakdown of Rome, and we looked at the pansexuality, okay? There was a danger of this getting into the church. And in the last days, it happens. This stuff gets in. But the absurd, this woman Anglican clergy thing, whatever she is, on YouTube, saying, I know Greek, you don't know Greek, and homosexuality, well, I know Greek, because she was speaking a lot of rubbish. <laughs> they argue about words. They get into this thing of logo-making, logo-making, engaging in controversy about words and, and their meaning. This is a useless practice that's, whose results are going to be catastrophic. The results will be catastrophic. When you see people doing this, instead of being like Jesus, interpreting the letter in light of the spirit, looking at text, context, and co-text, you're looking at something that's going to end in catastrophe. Catastrophe for the hearers, okay? Catastrophe literally means in Greek upsetting or going down, put it into decline, okay, of, of those, of the ones who hear. Uh, the next thing he says is, Spaldeson, Siuton, Dokumon, Parisetai totheo egonen anipesukutan orthotomanta ton logon tes eletheas. Be diligent. Concentrate on presenting. Not what you teach, but yourself. You are presenting yourself by what you teach. <laughs> okay. Dokimon is tested and qualified. Have you tested and qualified what you believe and what you're going to teach? Now, if a preacher is not testing 
and qualifying what he's going to preach or teach. He's not studying to show himself approved. Okay. Unto God. Then it goes on. A worker or an actor, the Theon Ergenton, and a Pixon Kun Oton, or the Tomanta, Ton Logon Tesalavius. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. If somebody does not study, God does not approve of them. Be careful of preachers who stand up and there's no substance in what they teach. It's just motivational speaking or something like this. It sounds nice, it tickles people's ears, but there's no substance, there's no exposition of scripture. God does not approve of such people. You know, the ones who stand up every week, they're gonna share what's on their heart because there's nothing in their brain. <laughs> Keep away from them. Keep away from such people. God does not approve of them. Now, if God does not approve of them, we ought not approve of them either. They are called by a word that could be either actor or workman. <laughs> if you study if you study to show yourself approved, you are a workman. If you don't study to show yourself approved and you stand up to preach, you are a thespian. You are an actor. <laughs> you understand? Is a pastor, is a Christian author, is a preacher a worker or an actor? there can be some very convincing actors, even in the world. They use method acting, and Stanislavski and method and things like this. I once briefly met Ben Kingsley. He played Gandhi in the movie. Nice man, intelligent guy, nice man, friendly. I just met him very briefly. Um, I saw an interview of him when the film Gandhi won the Academy Award. He literally, in his mind, became Gandhi. He put up posters and pictures of Gandhi and it was reading everything about Gandhi and he took on the imitation of Gandhi, not just when he was in front of the camera. He became Gandhi in his life. He lived like Gandhi for a couple of months, okay, before he began filming the film. He was a very convincing Gandhi. <laughs> he said the minute it was the wrap up and they finished the film, he tore down all the posters, he tore down all the pictures, he stopped eating Indian food, I think. He stopped, he didn't want nothing to do with it. He was, he became Gandhi. Now, this, this guy's a talented actor, but he actually became somebody. There's people who, who can do this, you know, Lawrence Olivier could do this. You know, P Peter, I met Peter O'Toole in New York, well, drunken Irishman, but talented. Invited <laughs> me to his house in Galway. <laughs> he became Beckett. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he, he became Beckett. He was a really good actor. Dustin Hoffman was a really good actor. These guys, they're very talented actors. There are people in pulpits who are very talented actors. You understand? They're playing a role theatrically. They're an actor playing the role of a preacher. But they're not preachers. They don't know what a real preacher would know. You have to study to show yourself approved. They didn't study the scriptures to be a preacher. They studied preachers. You understand? They didn't imitate Christ to become a preacher. They imitated preachers. You understand? It com becomes about technique and phonation, body language. They're just actors. They know how to look at somebody 
and, 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 and size up how this person behaves and thinks and their gestures, and they, they imitate it very convincingly, you know, if they're, if they're a good actor. And unfortunately, the church has better actors than Hollywood. It has better actors than the West End. We've got a lot of actors out there. You understand what Paul is saying? The ones who don't study are not workmen. They are actors. And they are good at it. Not good at preaching. Not good at expounding the scriptures. But good at acting. What a mess. What a mess. That you don't need to be ashamed before the Lord, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is the main word in scripture for exegesis. This word, orthopomante. Orthopomante. Uh, correctly partitioning or erect cutting. You know when you have a kid with crooked teeth, you have to take the child to a specialist dentist called an orthodontist. If you do not correct that problem orthodontically when the kid is young, those teeth are going to be crooked and it becomes dentally, medically almost impossible to fix it. You got to correct it in the beginning. Once the baby teeth are gone and the real teeth come in, uh, the adult teeth come in and the teeth are crooked, you got to fix it. The kid needs braces. I used to call my sister Bucky Beaver. <laughs> Why you call me Bucky Beaver? <laughs> she got the braces. Ortho. Ortho means erect. Let's look at another. Ortho. So we have orthodontics. If you don't straighten the teeth out at an early point in childhood, early adolescence, if you don't straighten it out then, it's not going to get straightened out. Okay? Another usually congenital condition, I got to be careful, we have a few medical doctors with us, I don't like to make any mistakes. Scoliosis. Someone born with the curvature of the spine congenitally. You got to correct it when they're a kid. There's like different techniques, including the insertion of a titanium rod that can be progressively tightened with uh, sometimes even laparoscopic procedures. They can tighten it up progressively and straighten the spine. Otherwise, you're going to have to rename your kid Quasimodo. You got to straighten it out at an early point. If you don't straighten out congenital scoliosis at an early point, it's not going to get straightened out. The vertebrae will not be straightenable. You need it when the tissue is still formative. Once the hard tissue is in that shape of an arch, it's not going to get straightened. Proverbs. 8-9, I believe. All things are straight to him who understands. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. That which is crooked, I'm going from the Hebrew now, cannot be made straight unless something is fixed at an early point. Just like in orthopedic medicine and surgery, just like in dental orthodontics. Unless you straighten it out at an early point, it cannot be fixed. You can't straighten up the leaning tower of Pisa. It's not going to happen. 
all kinds of engineers and architects and geologists have looked at the Tower of Pisa. That's the way it is. The most they can hope is it doesn't fall down. They ban traffic from the streets and things like this from around it to keep it. Keep it down. Well, it makes it a curiosity because it's tilted. <laughs> but it wasn't intended to be. Quasimodo was a curiosity. <laughs> but he was a victim of a birth defect. Well, that which is crooked cannot be made straight. Okay. All things are straight. The Greek word from the Septuagint. Ortho. Yeshar in Hebrew. Ortho. Ortho. Structure. Straight structure. Why could it not a bone of Jesus have been broken from the Paschal Lamb? The scriptures could not be broken. You understand? <laughs> The structure of the scriptures had to be there. None of his bones could be broken. Ortho. If something is not correct, if it's not ortho. Now, what word in English do we get from ortho? Orthodox. If something is not ortho, it is not orthodox. It is heterodox. It becomes false doctrine. You understand? Once something is crooked, it cannot be made straight. It is not orthodox. It will only produce heresy, error, false doctrine, apostasy, whatever. And you can't fix it. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. If you catch the scoliosis, okay, postnatally at an early point, they can begin planning from infancy, how they're going to deal with this kid's problem and straighten out the spinal column. Your teenager, your 12-year-old gets crooked teeth. The dentist says, I'm going to refer you to an orthodontist. Orthodontist comes in, yeah, I can straighten this out at an early point. In a church, in a ministry, in a fellowship, in a movement, the same thing happens. Same thing. When something goes off, you must straighten it out at an early point. If something is unorthodox, if it is not straightened out at an early point, it is going to be crooked. You can't straighten the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You can't straighten buck teeth once you've got them. The pop star homosexual died of AIDS, Freddie Mercury, he would have fixed his teeth if he could have. Those teeth could have been fixed when he was a kid, but he had this protruding dentition, you know. That was it. With all of his money, <laughs> he couldn't get it fixed. You cannot make it straight. When somebody has that kind of a hunchback in adult life, there's nothing they can do. Nothing. It's terrible. You got to get it quick. You got to get it quick. Some years ago, we did a teaching called The Devil's Geometry. Also, we had the devil's algebra, but we had the devil's geometry. Two lines can seem to be going parallel, but a slight deviation in angulation. Although it doesn't seem like much initially, eventually they're going to go in two different directions. <laughs> Although initially the difference is minute, a slight change in angulation is going to put them in two different destinations. You must correct the deviation in the angulation at an early point. Every navigator knows that. Every navigator knows that. You've got to correct the deviation initially as soon as it happens. 
They've got gyroscopes and things like this. They correct it immediately. Navigators know about this stuff. They correct it immediately. Okay. All you need is a slight change and angulation, and you're going to wind up in two different places. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take the American Purit the Puritans who came from England to the to America on the Mayflower. They were heading for Virginia. They wound up in Massachusetts by accident. <laughs> there was a slight change <laughs> and, <laughs> in the angulation and the navigation from Plymouth, England to, to the States, or then, then colonial America. A slight change because of the, the winter storms in the North, in the North Atlantic. And they, <laughs> they want to, this is in Virginia. <laughs> It's Massachusetts, Virginia's several hundred miles to the south. You got to the wrong, wrong place. That's all it takes. And they got there by accident. Now these were Christians, you understand. These were Bible-believing Christians who geographically wound up in the wrong place because of a change in angulation. Something must be kept straight. Any change in angulation must be corrected in navigation, in medicine, in dentistry, and in theology. Ortho, orthodox. Does everyone understand? It's got to be straight. Now, it speaks of rightly dividing, again, Orthopomontes. When you rightly divide it, it is straight. An autopsy, a postmortem on a corpse, positions the corpse, the cranium to the feet, straight. The soft tissue articulates with the hard tissue. Pathologist tries to put the corpse in the natural position it would be if it were alive. You don't bend it up. <laughs> you try to keep the stiff straight. Find out what killed it. Begin with cranial resection and you work your way down and like that. It's got to be straight. You always look for what's straight. The scientist, the physician, Navigator, airplane pilot, they're always looking for one straight. Well, you wouldn't want a physician or a dentist or a pilot <laughs> who didn't know how to navigate, would you? <laughs> I got to fly to Asia on Thursday. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't want to wind up on the Ivory Coast or something. <laughs> You don't want to get on a plane with a pilot who doesn't know how to navigate. But there are a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians, in churches with a pastor who doesn't know how to navigate. He has not studied to show himself approved. Think of somebody who gets dressed up like an airline pilot in the uniform and he puts on the wings, <laughs> nice and polished, and he looks like a pilot. And you get on the Boeing's 777 over water, <laughs> and he's standing there greeting the passengers. The problem is he doesn't know anything <laughs> about avionics, about navigation, about computers, about meteorology. He doesn't know anything <laughs> that a pilot is supposed to know. He's just an actor <laughs> playing the role of a pilot. He never studied aviation. He studied pilots. <laughs> he can look the part. He can look the part. He can look just like you'd swear he was a pilot practically. If you weren't a Christian, you'd sign an affidavit. Yeah. <laughs> He's not a pilot. 
He's not a pilot. It's unbelievable. In holistic medicine, there's people running around calling themselves doctors, physicians. These people are dangerous. They're quacks. Yet they're going around identifying themselves as doctors. But they're not. They're not. Now, I'm not saying there may not be things to learn from alternative medicine evaluated physiologically, but I, I, I went to Bad Ning, China. Bad Ning, where it comes from. And although you can make arguments that acupuncture and acupressure are at points where there is a concentration of, of sympathetic ganglia, and people have looked at this physiologically and said, there may be a, a scientific basis to this stuff, okay, you can say that. But at the same place, it was all based on Taoism. It was based on yin and yang. It was based on Taoism. And they were selling Westerners, I don't know what it was, they called it wine in a jar with six dead snakes in it. And the toxins of the snakes were obviously seeping into this wine and they sold it by the tablespoon as an aphrodisiac. <laughs> Now, you've got to separate anything that may be physiologically true from the superstition, okay, from the superstition. Well, it's like anything. To the Greeks, astrology and astronomy were the same thing. In the Enlightenment, they split, okay. Folk medicine, healing arts, and medical science were the same. Medicine, dentistry, pharmacology went one way. <laughs> Folk medicine went the other way. People were putting butter on burns and stuff. And did that. And they believed it. Uh, it used to be called alchemy. Chemistry and physics went one way. The other way was magic. But originally, the magic, if they didn't know, you got salt, sodium chloride. <laughs> you add sodium and you add chloride, and you, now you got salt. Look, it's magic. That they thought it was magic. They didn't understand about electrons shifting between the orbitals of atoms. They didn't understand ionic bonding and things like this, so they thought it was magic. They didn't make this. Now, pay attention. I've warned about this many times. I'm going to say it once more. One of the things you're seeing now is a rapprochement between science and the occult. The Enlightenment split these things. In computer video graphics and holography. Okay. In holistic medicine. Okay. And in certain aspects of particle physics, you are seeing a rapprochement, a coming back together of science and the occult. That which split is coming back together. But it's getting into the church. It is getting into the church. Occult practices, superstitions, are getting into the church. Much of what is taught and believed about curse theology and about uh, demonology comes from superstition. It does not come from scripture, but people believe it. You ask these people who cast demons out of believers, where did the apostles ever cast a demon out of somebody who was saved? They can't show you. You ask these people, well, if that is the way to deal with the world, the flesh, and the devil, why did the apostles never teach it? They can't answer. You understand, this stuff gets in. When people do not study to show themselves approved, crazy stuff gets in. And they begin to argue about the meaning of words.
That's what happens. Orthopomontes. Now, let's go further. In real exegesis, it is always straight. That which is crooked cannot be straight. But to he who understands, all things are straight. To those who study themselves, study to show themselves approved unto God, exegeting the scriptures under the illumination of the Holy Spirit, it's straight. To those who don't, it's crooked. And that which is crooked cannot be made straight. You cannot cure scoliosis in an adult. It doesn't work. It can't be made straight. Do not think that these churches that have gone this way can be made straight. They cannot. You can put grain into a poison stew and neutralize the effect of false doctrine. But you're not going to make the false doctrine go away. It can't be made straight. Look at the Church of England. Just look at Anglicanism. Institutionally, Anglicanism was born out of the womanizing and political ambitions of Henry VIII. Henry VIII initially opposed the Reformation. He and Cardinal Wolsey were no friends of Protestantism or of Evangelicism. Wolsey murdered William Tyndale. This was Henry. Uh, okay. But then after Henry died, there was Edward VI, the kid, who was influenced by Thomas Cranmer. And they were believers. Those guys tried to evangelize the Church of England, which at that time had only been the Catholic Church having the British monarch instead of the king. That's all it was. There were people who tried to reform it, and most of them were martyred by Queen Mary. Then Elizabeth comes, and she saves England from Mary and from Mary, Queen of Scots. She saves the country. Uh, but she had a Catholic majority initially. I mean, Elizabeth saved, politically, she saved the country. And also from the, from the Armada, you know, the, the, the Pope wanted the Catholic powers of Europe to conquer Britain to, to make it Catholic, make it under the papacy again. Well, don't make, don't un ignore this fact. It's the same struggle going on with Brexit. You understand? It's the same struggle going on with. It's the same spiritually. It's the same thing. Okay. Let's see. Only now you got politicians. <laughs> same as in the time of Elizabeth I. Okay. Well, how does this stuff happen? Well, the, oh, the charismatic renewal. Okay, when you renew, you renew. Did the charismatic renewal persuade the Church of England to say Christ is the head of the church, not the monarch? No. Oh. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. Did the charismatic renewal persuade people to say Scripture teaches believers baptism? You can't take a baby out of a pram and put it in a coffin if it's not dead. We're baptized into his death. These people must become nuclear. No, no, that didn't change. Didn't change at all. Now, there were some good Anglicans like J.C. Ryle and things like this. I'm not saying there weren't. But the institution itself, the Church of England, that which is crooked cannot be made straight. They might have had the low church and the high church and all this. If you don't correct this stuff, then it's not going to get corrected. John Wesley found that out. John Wesley never wanted to leave the Church of England. The Methodists were forced out. Why? Because Wesley came to the realization that that which is crooked cannot be made straight. No matter how much you try, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> the kid's teeth are crooked. You better fix them now. And the state's orthodontics are very expensive. 
braces are expensive. We don't have national health in the states. There is dental insurance, but braces are expensive. Parents do it because they know what's going to happen if they don't. They do it. Okay. Same thing with the scripture. You got to fix it soon or you're going to have trouble. Romans 16. Mark a factious man. Mark a factious man. Okay. That word factious is dicostasia. Essentially, basis, etymological basis of dichotomy. A split. Dicostasia. It's the one who stays orthodox. It's the one who stays straight, who's not factious. It's the one who deviates from what is straight, who's factious. You understand? In an age of apostasy, something happens. The majority deviates from what is straight. In a real revival, the majority stay straight, go straight. Okay. In an apostasy, the majority deviates from what is straight. Mark the people who do that. Now, of course, what do they do? Well, they do the very thing that Paul says not to do. They engage in logo making. They argue about words, and they say, you're divisive. You're factious. You don't approve of uh, the laughing and drunken revival, or you're divisive. You're condemning the ecumenical. You're divisive. No, it's the one who stayed straight, who stayed on the, the orthodox. That's not divisive. It's the one who departed from it who's divisive. But once they stop orthopomantes, once they stop rightly dividing the word of God on the basis of what is straight, they're going to become factious. They'll form a faction. We're to mock such people. Now in an apostasy, they constitute the majority. This is not a new phenomena. In the days of Elijah, there was 7,000. <laughs> One and a half million followed Jezebel and Ahab. 7,000 followed the Torah. <laughs> Who was divisive? Jezebel treated Elijah and the sons of the prophets as if they were divisive. <laughs> Later, Elisha, they were the ones who were seen as divisive. No, they were the ones who were orthodox. Mark such people. They're not orthodox. They don't rightly divide the word of God. When the word of God is not rightly divided, there's going to be disputes about words and meanings. But if you rightly divide the word of God, there's going to be far less arguments about doctrine. You understand? Well, let's continue. So, study to show yourself approved. Be a workman, not an actor. Then we're told, shun profane and vain babblings. Uh, how does the English translations put it? Avoid worldly and empty chatter. It will lead to further ungodliness. I'll translate the original Greek. Teste babylos. Oh, I love this word. Kenophonias. Peristeso epipleon. Der prokopusin asiberes. The yet profane, 
they're babylos. Their babbling is profane. Now, what does profane mean? We think of it as profanity, you know, vulgar language and things like that. Profane means, in Hebrew and in Greek thought, to take something that is set apart, holy, separate, and make it common. You understand? It makes the holy common. It makes the holy common. They begin to read the word of God the way they would read a secular book. <laughs> now that's not to say we shouldn't pay attention to grammatical historical exegesis. We should. But we need to understand it is Holy Spirit revelation. They make it common and they begin babbling. Canophonias. Empty sounds prattling. They're Kenophonic, kenophonic, kenophony. <laughs> I've heard so many sermons that are pure, pure kenophony, if I'm going to invent the word. <laughs> They're kenophonic. It's just religious babbling. That's all. Once you do not orthopomantes, you're going to engage in religious babble. That will be profane. Okay. Empty words, no meaning, no value. Peristazo, they'll, they'll, they'll be around or standing aloof from. Oh, oh, oh. An increase unto war on godliness, they put it. Prokoposin, it will be progressing towards unreverence, as a base, it's an ungodliness. Now understand the relation between profane and irreverence, okay? When something is holy, set apart, it's to be revered. The things of God are to be revered. When you profane it, you degrade it. When you profane something that is to be revered, you profane it, and you no longer treat it reverently. That's what happens when people stop rightly dividing the word of God. They engage in religious babble. That is worthless, and that will increase irreverence. Well. Then it continues, and their word will eat as doth a canker, it says in the old King James. A better translation, Kairologos, <laughs> and the word, outtone of them, hos gangarina. Gangrene, gangrenous tissue, necrosis. People would Serious diabetes need to wear special shoes. Otherwise, they'll be candidates for amputation. You got a wound on your foot, the first thing the physician's gonna ask you, you were diabetic. That'll be the first thing, that'll be the first thing the doctor's gonna ask you, probably. Am I right, doctor? You see a wound on the foot? Are you, that's the first question. No man, like pastures, exehostophone of them. Uh, where am I going with this? Like feeds them on it, pastures them, like 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 they feed on this this stuff, and the result of it will be a gangrene. Then he says, among whom, Estin, Humanios, Hymenius, and Philitos. He actually names the people who are doing it. He names them. Rick Warren should be renamed 
Hymenius, Joel Austin, Joseph Prince. They should be renamed Philitus. They do the same thing. It's acting. They are actors. They are not engaging in orthopomontes. They are engaging in religious babble that will bring about gangrene to the body of Christ. You understand? Once you stop rightly dividing the word of God, you talk rubbish. Now, a mature Christian, a discerning Christian, can dismiss the rubbish. He may have a good immune system. New believers or people who have never been taught the word of God, they're easily swayed by it. But an age of apostasy is worse. There are people who went to Bible college and seminary who buy into it. People who can read Greek and Hebrew buy into it. In South Africa, because of the ANC, there's a problem in the hospitals. You've got proper physicians, but in the name of African nationalism, they have to allow Sangormas, witch doctors, into hospitals. And they come with something called Muti. Muti is like fetishism and potions and things like, and they have a legal right to do it. So you've got this conflict between those who are practicing medical science and those who are practicing witchcraft. And they tried to make the two coexist in the hospital wards. This is stupid, but that's what they do. So Guamas in South Africa have told people with AIDS, there's a lot of HIV, if you rape a baby, your AIDS will be cured. On bus stops, and so I'm not joking, you'll see posters on bus stops, having sex with your baby will not cure your AIDS. The witch doctors told them this. The World Health Organization nearly eradicated polio in sub-Saharan Africa, nearly eradicated it from the Sahel in the late 1950s, early 1960s. They nearly eradicated it. Not much polio. Polio has seen a tremendous resurgence now in the Sahel in Africa. Why? Because Islamic mullahs, preachers in the mosques, objected to the fact that the medical scientist and physician who discovered poliomyosin, or Jonas Salk, was a Jew. Therefore, Polio inoculation is a Zionist conspiracy. <laughs> and they told people not to have their children inoculated. And so the epidemiologists see a statistical resurgence of polio in a place that was nearly wiped out. There was a huge effort by the World Health Organization to wipe it out. Now it's made a comeback. Bad science, yeah, and bad theology. <laughs> Islam is bad theology. Witch doctors have bad, the they have a theology. So Gorma's witch doctors, they do have a theology, but it's shamanism. It's shamanism. The mullahs have a theology, but it is Islam. They've got a theology. Now, we can say this about witch doctors and about mullahs. I'm telling you, it's no less true of Hymenius and Philitus. It is no less true of Mara Cirillo and Elam, who promoted him, and Colin Dye and these guys. It's no less true. I got no problem talking about Muslims and witch doctors. 
We're talking about people who say they're believers. Remember that little girl died when Cirillo pronounced her healed? Yeah. And that other woman who stopped taking the anti-epilepsy medication drowned in her bath? Yeah. So Montague Levine, he was the, ro the royal pathologist for England and Wales, did the post-mortem after the, in the autopsy report. He put this in the autopsy report and he had it entered into the coroner's report that this woman would be alive if she didn't go to the Mara Cirillo cruise. This stuff kills. I had a friend in New York, Jewish guy, very intelligent otherwise, Bill Horowitz. Knew how to make money in the futures market and he was technically very smart with electrical, mechanical things. Bright guy, but he got into the word faith thing. And he got into this thing and you just get the anointing of the pastor, you don't take medical science, you, you know. You're, he gets, oh God. Anyway, he developed trigonosis. Could have been cured at an early point. They thought because he was a Jew, he didn't eat pork in New York. He got the trigonosis. And he gets himself anointed and he claims the healing. He's dead. He was like 33, 34 years old. He's dead. He died from that stuff. False doctrine kills. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. When you deviate from orthodoxy, when you stop rightly dividing the word of God, you're heading for trouble. In some cases, I know of personally, it has resulted in premature biological death. It has resulted in reduced longevity. It can actually kill people physically unnecessarily. That happens. It happens to Christians. It's happened to Christians who I know. Go to that. He names these guys. We should name these people. What they do is a shame and a disgrace. It spreads gangrene into the body of Christ. Elam is a vehicle for spreading gangrene. Colin Dye promoted Cirillo. The UK Advertising Standards Council found him guilty of all four charges against him for fraudulent fundraising. It meant nothing to Kensington Temple Elam Colin. In fact, they said, if you kick him out of the Evangelical Alliance, we're going to resign. So finally, they were forced to kick Sorello out of the Evangelical Alliance, and Kensington Temple resigned from it. This is Hymenius. This is Philitus. This is Elam. This is Maris Sorello. They do the same thing. Am I divisive by naming these people? <laughs> no, no. They're the ones who deviated from orthodoxy. <laughs> Medical science has never been in competition with faith, and faith has never been in competition with medical science. Luke practiced medicine. It's absurd. Well, let's look a little further. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. When you deviate from orthodoxy, it is a result of not orthopomantes, of not rightly dividing the word of God, of not having right exegesis, of not having text, context, co-text, of not giving the priority to the original meaning of the original languages. Nehemiah 8.8. 8 etc., etc. Once that happens, they're going to argue about words. I want this to be an ominate. I've said enough about it publicly, but I'll tell you something that's happened recently. What do you do when a guy who'd been a good preacher, who you recommended, invites somebody to his pulpit who teaches that the two witnesses 
in Revelation 11 are God the Father and God the Holy Spirit who must come and be killed in Jerusalem like Jesus was. And then he goes on an itinerary with this guy in Australia, knowing what he teaches and knowing it's wrong. His defense. This was his defense. Yeah, but he didn't say that they die for sin. They didn't say they die to make atonement. He just says that they come as men and die, and I don't agree with that, but he didn't say <laughs> It doesn't matter what he said. 1 Corinthians 5 says, God was in Christ reconciling us to God on the cross. The only reason a person of the Godhead dies is to reconcile, is to make atonement. It's the only reason. It's the only reason so you're saying that the Holy Spirit and the Father come and die not to make atonement? The only reason a person of the Trinity dies by what orthodox exegesis is to make atonement. God was in Christ reconciling us. How can you justify this? Well, he didn't say they died for sin. Yeah, but First Corinthians says the death of a person of the Godhead is for sin, and it is only the Son. It is not the Father, and it is not the Holy Spirit. He begins playing games with the words. Lo, he's logomenkian. He began with silly religious babbling, trying to justify the unjustifiable trying to defend having had this guy in his pulpit and traveling itinerary in Australia with this guy who teaches this stuff. Even though he admits it's wrong! Religious babble. What do you do? This stuff happens in the last days. This stuff happens. In an apostasy, there is a turning away from orthodoxy. They stop orthopomantes. Exegetically, if you looked at 1 Corinthians, if you looked at Scripture in light of Scripture, if you looked at Revelation 11 in light of what Paul says, it is only the Son who dies, which he admits. And he dies to bring reconciliation. The idea that the Father and the Holy Spirit come and die not to bring reconciliation? What they died for? They had nothing else to do. <laughs> this is absurd. It's not. What is it? It's babble, isn't it? It's empty, worthless babble that results in false doctrine and spreads like gangrene. Spreads like gangrene. I can say more. That's just one example. They play games with the words. Once you stop exegeting, once you stop orthopomontes, once you stop rightly dividing, you're going to begin playing games with the word. It's lo logomanchian. Logomanchian or orthopomontes, it's going to be one or the other. Preacher is either going to be a worker who will not be ashamed or an actor who will be. That's what it comes to. That's what Paul is saying. And that's what Paul is saying the last days are going to be like.